welcome to episode 10 of the PBQ Slush Pile. We take more time than other editorial boards, but we stand behind our methodology so much so that we're going to share our process with you through this podcast. Welcome to the editorial table. Episode 10. Woo-hoo. We did it. 10. There should be something happening, like Yay. like champagne. Where's that Prosecco, Mayor? <laughs> Mary glug, just... glug, 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 glug. <laughs> um, I'm Kathleen Volkmiller, and I'm the director of the um, publishing program here at Drexel and co-editor of the Painter by Quarterly, and um, I write memoir, and um, I have two lovely folks with me in the studio today, and I'm going to start with Tim Fitz. Hi, my name is Tim Fitz, and I teach here at Drexel University. And I've been reading with the Painted Bride Quarterly for about three years. And I write mostly short fiction, but also novels. But don't you have news? Y- yes, I've got, a, <laughs> I've got a short story collection coming out next year with Mad Hat Press, which I'm very oh, pleased yeah. with. Isn't that awesome? Happy about this. It's going to be released at AWP, so we'll have more reason to oh, celebrate nice. there. Yeah. That's great. Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Isabella Fadanza. I am an English major here at Drexel, actually soon to be graduating. I'm giving my senior presentation today. Woohoo! More and reasons woo-hoo. for champagne. Yeah, and uh, I've been reading with PBQ for probably like a year and a half, and I've done a couple of internships, so it's been a lot of fun. That's terrific. And Marion, Dr. Ren is back from Abu Dhabi. Where are you now? I am sitting in my tiny little apartment. Um, I banished my husband. He's out getting coffee, so I have the place to myself. We're on 7th Avenue down in the West Village. I'm happy to be back in your time zone. Yes. Thank you. Um, And I have been with PBQ for quite a long time, co-editing with Kathy. Um, And I, let's see, I have an essay out in a book that's just been released called Talking Back to Globalization. Um, texts and practices and the piece I wrote is called strategic sociability and it's about um, the journalists and the Cold War very cool Jason where are you today I am back in Brooklyn I am back happily in my home at my bright yellow Parsons table <laughs> and um, I have been with PBQ a very long time <laughs> and I just uh, had my third book of poems published by Red Hen Press uh, called Primary Source. Woohoo! Yeah. Congrats! And it's beautiful. It has a fabulous cover. Um, Miriam, glad to know that you're with us today. Where are you? I am in Union Square in an office I don't normally sit in. So I recently <laughs> found outlets. I was crawling around for a little while, plugging my laptop, and I'm excited to be here. Okay, <laughs> but you're off the floor now, right? You're sitting up, right? I'm off the floor. I'm in a chair. It's very comfortable. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> okay, since Maryam and Marion's name so, sound so alike, we're going to call um, Marion uh, Dr. Ren or Ren to distinguish them as we uh, converse today. Um, we've had some wacky things happen over the past few uh, episodes of this podcast, and uh, we, we would like to... Dr- address them during this episode, but uh, we're going to warm up with the poems. Um, Remember that the poems we discuss can be found on our show notes um, on our website, pbq.drexel.edu, for the most part. Uh, Click the podcast at the top right of the page and read along or check out the work after you you listen to this. Uh, First up today is Jen, oh my, Karatnik? Karatnik? What do you guys think? I think it's Karatnik okay. or Karetnik. We'll it could be, yeah, because Karatnik is kind of funny. Sorry, Jen. Okay, first up is Jen Karetnik uh, with a poem that she submitted for the Locals issue. When we asked her if we could discuss the poem, she said she loved the idea of the podcast editorial meeting, though it might prove to be a little nerve-wracking. I'm sure my students who get put through the workshop ringer all year long will consider it more than just. So so for their sake alone, I'm delighted to say yes. I kind of love that and thought we should share that, that she's willing to let her work get um, discussed by us today in such a brave, a brave response. move. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, so I hope she does tell her students to listen to this uh, when it's released so that they can chime in as well. Um, who'd like to do the reading for us? I'll read it. Um, and the poem is called The Physics of Falling Mangoes. 
Um, and by the way, this is Marion again. Uh, so just so you know whose voice is whose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Must be Dr. Ren. Oh, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Ren. Very distinguished Dr. Um, Ren. So the other thing that, that Jen let us know, too, was that it's mango season. So it's quite appropriate to be discussing the physics of falling mangoes. If a Hayden mango full with sun and an ovoid Irwin, that ornament of dawn, drop at the same time from panicles equivalent in height, will they accelerate identically despite degrees of heft of maturity, the knowledge of their own ripeness? Physics says yes, despite mass, even if it's a late season Beverly, still green, set upon too early by a squirrel sitting on its stem or an Indian mango five pounds large, swaying all summer too big for the basket of the tool I wield like lightning to strike a singular fruit. The damage then, that should be equal to. But all things considered, there is no free fall. Air on a humid wind can change its resistance and there is no formula to adjust for the destructive means of a mango during descent, helicoptering sap through the day's work of spider webs, a season of boat shaped leaves that bear those burns until they themselves release and the twigs it breaks without discrimination, whether they are ready to reach like hands or be struck down to the ground. And the ground, which could be oolite or limestone, grass or a brother mango, the driveway or the chemical buffer of pool water, my shoulder or arm or skull willing to take the aromatic knock. I know the parts of the equation, limb, fruit, gravity, but not the sum upon landing wholly bruised, flesh protected by deflection, or a split that turned every possible way, simply, dumbly smiles. Thank you. Yay. There's a <laughs> lot of, a lot of science-y <laughs> words in there and you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little, I, actually some of those words I, I do want to get, get my Google on for. Right? <laughs> so, what is oolite? Does anybody know what oolite is? It's O O L I T E. No. It's like a manufactured sand. Like it's like the stuff that you put at the bottom of an aquarium. Oh. Or oh. 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 That's extra it. credit, Jason. Look wait, that. we don't we don't need no Google. We got a Schneiderman. Let's we Schneiderman it. Schneiderman. Let's Schneiderman, Schneiderman it. Google like five seconds ahead of you. Uh, uh, well, you know what? I want to just, I, I want to totally talk about this poem, of course, of course. But I just want to interrupt for one second and, and say that sometimes when we're having PDQ meetings, especially when I have a lot of students at the table and people start immediately saying things like, um, what's ovoid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I say, well, wait a minute. Let's figure out if we even care what ovoid is. <laughs> Do we want to Google it? Or Schneider Minute, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that question is already answered by the fact that we've even brought it to this table, this podcast today. But um, I just felt like saying that. <laughs> That's a good point. Definitely. Well, one of the things that I, I did like about the poem, and one of the things that made me trust it was the vocabulary, that it seemed to have a very intimate knowledge of the setting where mangoes grow. And I don't think I've ever knowingly seen a mango tree. <laughs> um, but I, I really did trust this idea of kind of what was going on and like the spider webs and the oolite and the limestone. Um, in, in, in a lot of ways, they did the work of making me trust the author more than necessarily like, you know, I mean, I, can, I of course, I'll like Google everything or, you know, figure out what all the words mean because I, I'm always on the side of larger vocabularies, <laughs> but um, I, I thought that the the intimacy of the vocabulary was a really important part of the poem. But it was neither; it wasn't exotifying. It wasn't like, "Ooh, I'm talking about ooh light." But it was, <laughs> it was, it was, <laughs> and I, I think that's really because a lot of people do that. They, you know, they're like, "I've I've gone somewhere that to me is exotic, and now I'm going to write about how exotic it is." <laughs> and, I, and I really, I always find that very. Um, I don't trust it. And, yeah. I, and I did trust this poem. I yeah. The I, way that it used language was very, really made me trust it. Yeah. She's in Miami. And she said that the mangoes, you know, are upon them now or are about to be something like that. I had to look once I heard, read this poem. My first reaction was to read where the heck she was from for, I think, exactly the reasons that Jason is citing, that mm -hmm. she wasn't writing about it like 
oh, isn't this cool with that, you know, what I call like that um, authorial intrusion, where you could feel the author going, aren't I smart? And isn't, isn't this exotic? Uh, but to get so much out of a falling mango, <laughs> you know, it's like the red wheelbarrow. You can tell that she eats mangoes all the time. <laughs> is still in love with mangoes, but also... As am I. <laughs> but there's also a mango tree in her neighborhood that she's probably walked past a, f- a few thousand times on the way to work, where she's just thought about it. And finally, this poem, just as she gives birth to this poem, <laughs> because it sounds like part of her environment. Yes. Which is, I think, what Jason was saying. Yeah. Yeah, for me, um, I mean, definitely the first thought, of course, being a student, <laughs> is you get the urge, oh, let me try and, you know, go about this in a very kind of research way and look up some words. But upon a second or third reading of the poem, um, what I'm getting out of it is this really interesting contrast between sort of the the variation of things found in nature, and that's something that can be described, but it's not really something you can put a tangible kind of measurement on. It's, it's sort of like, you know, expressing a feeling or talking about the humanities, I guess. And then there's the contrast with the logic of physics, which is a very kind of hard science, and it, and it doesn't, it somehow works like a duality without uh, taking away from it. But I just feel like even without this sort of technical or, or science background, you can really get something out of the piece. I really like that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I think part of that, too, is the, the real pleasure of putting um, different kinds of knowledge right up next to each other. So the idea that this, this piece of fruit has a knowledge of its own ripeness, like that's how the second stanza starts out, yeah. and that we can kind of entertain that idea and still consult physics, I think it's just a very delightful way of exploring an experience that's both personal and perhaps scientific. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I also think that it doesn't become in anti-intellectual. Like I was, I was, I don't know, I was just having some like bad experiences with anti-intellectualism and poetry. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's not saying that physics is wrong, but it's saying that one's human experience of ripe mangoes spreading sap as they fall through the spider webs is not captured by an equation about mass and velocity. Right. So Jason, I think that for me, like you just put your finger on an echo or a, a sort of like a subterranean illusion this poem is making to, um, what is it, Whitman's when I heard the learned astronomer, right? And that notion of like being schooled in the science and then being so overwhelmed by it that you you have to walk out of the classroom and, and sort of drift out and look at the stars. Um, so the end of the poem for me, right, with that line, you know, she's, you know, posing these questions, right? I know the parts of the equation, nim, fruit, gravity, but not the sum upon landing, wholly bruised flesh protected by deflection or a split that turned every possible way simply dumbly smiles. So dumbly smiles comes quite close to the kind of anti- <laughs> anti-intellectualism, right? <laughs> but it resists it. It really does resist it because of the accumulation of the specificity of the vocabulary, the rendering of the scene, the consideration of all the possibilities of the fruit falling, and then knowing all that, it's still a, the joy in, in the fruit itself, right? Like in the object itself. So. Well, it, it keeps it coming back to being really visceral. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. In fact, when Tim was, um, we're all injecting our own narratives on how this poet lives her life, right? (laughs) (laughs) She loves mangoes. She walks a certain way. Um, But honestly, I think the end of this poem is what began it for her. She was seeing all of these mangoes and can't shake that they look like they're smiling. These these (laughs) split mangoes on the ground, right? Like that. I really feel like the end is with the inspiration. For Interesting. The whole thing. Interesting. Yeah, I'm really. Um, well, gang, what kept... do you think? Are we ready to vote on this? <laughs> yeah. Oddly enough, just before coming here, I ate two champagne mangoes. <laughs> oh my yeah, goodness! Yeah, just about 45 minutes ago. And so, you knew what type yeah, they were. Mangoes. I was yeah. I was impressed by even all these different sorts of mangoes. I, I want to yeah. get my hands on the Indian five pounder. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we get one of those? Yeah, that's, you know what, and I, I have to go back to something I think Kathy said, or somebody said it earlier about this image of mangoes growing on trees. I've only ever seen mangoes, like, sort of stacked up at the grocers or 
on sticks um, handed out by, you know, women on the corner who can sort of knife them into these beautiful ornate shapes and then sell them to you for $5 on a, <laughs> on a stick. So this is, it's a, it's a, it's a lesson in, in mangoes for me. Uh, I have to say this. I was thinking of whether or not I say, but now that you're talking about these, exa- these um, carved mangoes on a stick, the way we do it in Philly is you buy them from a lunch truck in a food storage bag for $2. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Peeled nice. and sliced in a way I could never do. I mutilate yeah. a mango. And nice. they're just, yeah. Eat the mango, because if you get it wrong, you get all those, like, you know, terrible parts in the middle that are going to cut your tongue. It's yeah, like, all that fibery. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, okay. Let's get back to the voting. Let's call this meeting to order right now. <laughs> so um, we are six people. That's an even number, but I have a feeling we might be okay. Uh, are we ready in, in the studio? We're going to do our one, two, three shoot, and you guys are going to send text messages to Joe Zhang, our fabulous producer slash engineer. Okay? One, two, three, vote. Okay, it is unanimous. Cha-ching! Woohoo! Yay. I love when we accept them. Um, so we, we, need, we need like a special sound effect for when a poem gets accepted. We need like a special like party <laughs> sound effect. That's true. Maybe another sham. Maybe we really need to upload the champagne cork, Joe. That's actually that's a great idea. I, I like that. It, can we do that, Joe? At some point, I like that idea. And um, you know what's really wonderful too is Jen. Uh, Kretnik can really tell her students to come listen to this and feel good about it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Congratulations, Jen. Okay, so it was kind of fun today, too, that we have um, poems from, for two different themed issues. So that last one was for locals. Um, the next poem was submitted to our Monsters issue, but you probably would have guessed that as you hear it next. Um, and when we first asked Tria Wood, she said she was excited and intrigued and also a little nervous. Which, <laughs> there we go. There we, there we go. This makes me think of Maggie Queenie, uh, who we discussed in episode five, and she said, This is fascinating and terrifying. I'm in. <laughs> and I'm just so happy that we have so many brave poets submitting to PBQ. So keep it up out there, brave poets. Um, we now have Tria Wood with Godzilla Walks Into a Bar. I'm going to tackle this one. Isabella wants in. All right. I'm in. Godzilla walks into a bar. He's much smaller than you'd expect, really. Scaly, dark, and haggard. He's been sleeping it off for centuries. All that rage, dust and ashes washed out of the cracks in his suit by the surging Pacific. He's graceful, surprisingly so. Swan-like, even. He will not look at you. When he sits, his forearms pool on the bar like crayons in the sun. His belly is a flat tire collapsing into his crotch, and whatever may be there is hidden. He'll order something tropical, all rum and fruit and fire, incinerate the paper umbrella with a tiny burst that could have been a laugh. He swivels his head to watch it burn, left, right, then pokes its charred skeleton down into the tumbler and gives it a feeble stir with stubbed fingers. One dark claw etches delicate architecture into the condensation on the glass. And when he turns, half smiles at you, at last, you understand love at first sight. Thank you, Isabella. Great reading. That was great reading. Okie dokie. What are we thinking, guys? I was really skeptical when I sat down to read this, you know, <laughs> but I was very, very pleasantly supri- surprised. And um, I don't know, I kind of like this play on the tall, dark, and handsome stranger, uh, because I think the language is so sharp and precise that it moves away from the cliche and really falls into the category of like satire and actually being satire and working really well. Um, I don't know, just really small details. Um, You know, sort of the contrast between this grace and swan-like quality, which seems really silly when you're thinking about it, and then kind of the the forearms pooling like crowns in the sun and the belly being a flat tire. Um, You just have such a great series of contrasts there, and it somehow creates this genuine image. I don't know. It's very strange to think about. No, I loved that imagery in that fourth stanza. His forearms pull on the bar like crayons in the sun. That was really nice. Wow. Wow. I really enjoy the the bit of snark also that, you know, just the tone that continues to go through it. Uh, Phrases like whatever maybe there is hidden. Definitely enjoyed reading through that. Mm -hmm. 
I have to say I had the exact same reaction when I saw the title I thought yeah. I don't want to like this poem <laughs> yeah. Seriously. And, I, and I didn't I still didn't want to like it till I got to the wonderful images at stanza four and then it was just boom boom it had all those moments that I love having these images that pop and then with the sound image of Etch's delicate architecture into the condensation on the glass the funny thing is at that moment I thought oh my gosh I love this Godzilla <laughs> And then the next line was, you understand love at first sight. And I thought, you're right. I do. Now I do. And so I, I'm dying to hear what Jason has to say because I love the way he talks about poems. But the images and sound for me uh, just made me want to drive here faster after counting those two mangoes. Who thought that a paper umbrella could be so compelling? Oh, I love the rum and the... You know. fire, fruit and fire. I love that, yeah. Like, drinks are such a stereotypical thing to throw in there, and they're often boring. You could just take them right out, but I want this drink to remain in the poem. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I love the drink, and I love, I love the charred umbrella. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been thinking a lot about those. There, there's been a couple of articles recently about the kind of um, cultural stagnation that we're in, where we sort of, like, don't seem to be making very much but we seem to be making a lot of the same thing over and over again. So it's like, here's more Star Wars. Would you like more Star Wars? I'll get more Star Wars. Um, and, and Godzilla is kind of in this pantheon of, you know, these sort of like 20th century productions who seem to kind of like never go away. And there's like this kind of endless possibility for reinvention and to kind of present Godzilla as just being exhausted by it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, it drink. Um, and then to kind of like, revive it at the end with the speaker like just falling in love with this exhausted monster <laughs> yeah I'm, in love. I'm yeah. very happy yeah. uh, for some reason for me the line cracks in his suit just made me ponder maybe I was thinking way too much into it but I couldn't help wondering if we're sort of talking about like bringing in this uh, this dimension of the actor as Godzilla you know sort of like the the comical monkey suit image or Godzilla himself being dressed in a business suit to continue to like parody this, you know, this business guy sitting at the bar. So either way, I feel like it works. You don't really have to know the answer, but I'm, I'm happy that it's in there. Yeah. Uh, you know, when when I'm sure um, New York staff and Abu Dhabi staff, you experienced the same thing that we did uh, when we were, um, as we've been reading through monster submissions so many people do exactly what jason was talking about right and try to reimagine you know the cockroach <laughs> the, yeah, the, the, the vampire the whatever. vampire you know yeah. we had a lot of um um the you know the classic monsters are uh, reimagined by uh poets and i just think that this is um fresh and fun and still artful yeah, like it doesn't take itself too seriously, which is also why I think it works, uh, because it doesn't take itself too seriously. We can still appreciate the effort that was put into crafting it in such a particular way. Yeah. Um. But the sound of these of uh, these words, the uh-huh. etch's delicate architecture, it doesn't take itself too, too seriously, but you can tell that this poet is very serious about the craft. Yes. Yeah. I also, I, I really love the, the possibility of being able to look at a monster and read his history through his appearance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the kind of repetition of like these trace things, like he's etching something, but you know, his history is also kind of etched into him. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that that is something that uh, shows a real skill for characterization too. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, guys, I think we're ready to vote. Okay. You think? You agree? We're voting to vote? All right. All right ready to vote. One, two, three, vote. We have three positives in the studio, and we have three incoming from separate spots in New York. All yes. Perfect. And yet another. That, how many bottles of champagne is that at this time in the morning? We're doing commercial. I certainly need some today. If so. you want the car drink commercial, you can do that. <laughs> well, you know what's funny too is I, now I want mangoes. I want this rum drink. Yeah, this know, is setting ourselves up for a, a good party today. It, yeah, you know I want the mango poem reminds me of something I tell my creative writing students, and that's at some point in one of their drafts, 
pull in some images that really turn people on, whatever it is, whether it's grosses them out or makes them excited or hungry or whatever. <laughs> but throw in the mangoes, throw in something that makes them want to be inside the story or makes them revolted by the story. <laughs> and uh, and the mango poem really nails that. I mean, this is a great example of that, of ap- appealing to the senses, which is a simple lesson, but... yeah. Yeah, no, Important. I appreciate that. So congratulations, Trey Wood, as well. Um, wonderful. Two for two today. Always, it's just it's just a great day all around, I think. All of these things to celebrate, including two poems. Um, now we want to discuss a couple issues and hopefully clarify a few things that have been going on. Um, this is only our episode 10, like I said, but we're learning so much, and we're learning that podcasts are like theater. Uh, Though these conversations are recorded, they're conversations, and we can't know what's going to happen. We're dealing with real human beings and uh, writing back and forth to these poets we don't know and asking them to trust us, and and they don't know what they're doing either. And so it it can be... um, It's been so wonderful, but there's been some, like, strange little things that happened recently. Um, So I just wanted to let our listeners know that the poem Brazilian which we discussed in episode eight. Go back and listen if you haven't. Um, It was accepted elsewhere before we discussed it, and we literally crossed paths in the mail with our request to discuss the poem and its acceptance in another magazine. Yep. And the poet agreed that we should and could still discuss the poem, and uh, the conversation was so great. We had so much fun. We really didn't want to not have that recording going on, you know, and we were really upset with our bad timing. Um, I mean, this is sort of what electronic, I mean, one of the reasons that simultaneous submission has become so much more acceptable is because it literally things can't get crossed in the mail when they're not in the mail and online and e-communications are supposed to be um, instantaneous. And so if it's accepted and submittable, you know, that's supposed to be an instant ripple across all platforms and so it, it's interesting that you know exactly what simultaneous submission was designed the the the, the ban on simul- simultaneous submission was designed to prevent these sorts of things and then the internet was supposed to have ended that problem but clearly it hasn't <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. A, that's a a mis- really miscommunications point. still occur via via these systems right um <laughs> utopians yeah, I, I'd like to stay on this conversation of simultaneous submissions. And, you know, those of you who know me well know that I, I rant frequently on the plethora of literary magazines. And, you know, <laughs> the Council of Literary Mag- Magazines and Presses associated writing programs, they can't even get data on how many we have. And the guesstimate is about 8,000 to 10,000. But they can't um, really nail that number down because so many open and fold. Right. Um, So I want to put my teacher hat on. Maybe it's the influence of Isabella who's leaving me and I'll never be able to teach her anything again. Uh, That's not Uh, quite true. (laughs) But I I would just like to go on record that I think that people should make um, a tiered list for themselves and decide these these are my top six choices of where I want to send my work. And I'm going to only send to them wait for them to reject me no matter how long it takes a year a year and a half (laughs) and then once if if i get rejected from my first tier then i'll go down to the second tier because i mean easily once a month uh when we contact an author they have mistakenly not let us know to withdraw their work Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is not what happened with brazilian but i'm just saying that this occurs so they've yeah. mistakenly not told us, and they are regretful that they've let the piece go to the other mag, to the first mag that contacted. You know, directly say, "Oh, I would have rather it been in PVQ." Yeah, I mean, we should we should all definitely get that level of organization. I sort of think that um, you know, just because Jason was talking about all these things that have happened because of the internet, but um, I don't know. I I think that people have this idea now that the internet is so impersonal in a way that if you don't hear back from someone or you feel as though you're not hearing back from someone, you just 
it's almost considered a rejection in and of itself, which is a problem for sure. Uh, because yeah. when you yeah. have that attitude, then you kind of naturally end up not being sure of what to do. And um, it's just kind of a, a larger problem, but it's a symptom of many things, I guess. Probably a lot of it I don't understand, but it's it's uh-huh. definitely something to be dealt with. Yeah, well, like Jason talked about the electronic um, world, does digital war- uh, ability to communicate so quickly didn't really fix everything. We also have to factor in, you know, a bit of human error. (laughs) I am sure there are many poets who keep wonderful records who still occasionally slip up. Yeah, right. definitely. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always talked about, and, and, you know, sometimes I've I've not always followed my own advice, about just making sure that you never send work to a place where you're going to be sad that it appeared. (laughs) <laughs> what a what a wise piece of advice such good words yeah, and, and many people have these, these stories about you know like oh my god i didn't realize that i was submitting to cat fancy <laughs> and then I, thought, I thought it was for you know something else that was ironic but um <laughs> see that's I, what the digital age has done in of criticizing the person who likes you right I and mean, you never want to be in the position of saying like oh yeah well that journal took me boy were they dumb <laughs> uh, I don't like them, right? So it's it's you always want to make sure that when you're submitting your work, you're really submitting to work to a play. I mean, I, I was at a this this stands out for me. I was at a I was on a panel about publication um, at a, a conference for sort of emerging writers, and one of the people asked a question basically that said, you know, like I I shot too low, and I published <laughs> my work in a place that I kind of think isn't good enough for me. <laughs> And how can I get it back so that oh. I can republish it somewhere oh. better? Oh. And I was like, that's... No. The um, no. And move on. Like, you can republish the work in an anthology. If it's a press, you can wait till it goes out of print and you can get the rights back. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're like, we can talk about the specifics of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, that, you did that. Yeah. <laughs> you, oh, like, Jason, you, you, well, guess, you. I, we, I want to jump in on this and say, too, there's there's something about this entire process that speaks to a kind of relationship building between the publisher and the author. So, yeah. for instance, right, if you, if, you know, that comment that it takes a year for a magazine to get back to you, sadly, that's true. But as a writer, you know, it's really impossible. It's really difficult to wait that long for a response. Of course, you're going to simultaneously submit, right? I mean, it just makes perfect sense right to do that but the proper like decorum is then to let the, the you know the first publication know that you've done this especially when it's been accepted we all know that those are the rules but we've through the course of this podcast even right we've read poems and considered poems that we've sort of like done that kind of secondary solicitation for so for instance we send out a, an acceptance to a poet and they're like sorry it's been accepted elsewhere the next sometimes the next email is what else do you have? Do you have anything else? Can we consider more? Yeah. And that happens sort of infrequently, but that really does establish a kind of relationship between the journal and the author that um, I would say, you know, the, a piece of advice to writers is have something else. Like, all, like ha- you know, inshallah, you should have more in your archive, right? In your in your reservoir that you can send back out. Absolutely. So that they consider. I think we discussed this issue on episode two or three when we discussed um, Clara Chang because all these things can happen where mm-hmm. because we because somebody writes us and goes uh, poem number one was taken but you can still look at two and three that does make us pay attention to poems two and three like you oh, know like you're yeah. like oh wait a minute maybe we better look at this before it all gets sucked up mm-hmm. um, and then. Uh, we, I, what I was going to say is what Jason said about the person at the panel. We get that letter too, not as frequently, but you know, every other, every, you know, I don't know, oh, every other month or so, we get somebody who go, oh damn, <laughs> I just let this other magazine take it. Can I take it back so you can have it? Yeah, you know, <laughs> and um, you know, I think that that's kind of a, a good segue to the uh, next thing that we wanted to discuss, which is um, the, this whole idea of publication and what it means to be on our podcast pages um, and and not get accepted. Um, back to the case of the Brazilian person is, you know, he's letting us still put this on our podcast page, still discuss it, even though it's officially, formally being published in another magazine. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we were preparing to do this podcast in the first place, we had 
two separate intellectual property lawyers advise us. And um, publishing on our podcast page should not count, air quotes, um, as being published to other magazines, right? But all of that said, I can understand why poets might have a bit of trepidation. Yeah, definitely. I, I would think it would count as publication. Really? Say why, Jason. Because if, like, like I mean, so, you know, the New Yorker, for example, I, I don't know if they still have this, but for a long time they had, you know, like a contract with Toni Morrison, where they paid her a lot of money, um, but everything she published, everything she wrote, like, they had the right of first refusal. I right? see. Any, yeah. Anything that they're... Hmm. And so how does how does a magazine get traffic is if you're looking for that poem or if you're relying on it. And, and it was a little bit different in a more paper-based age but if i'm looking to teach that poem in class right and i google it mm -hmm. they want me to go to the poetry foundation or the new yorker website or whatever it was that published it for mm -hmm. me to pull that up to read it so if I'm reading it, like if I Google it and I get to the PBQ website, yeah. wouldn't that kind of publication? Well, you know what? That that's a um, that's something that hasn't happened yet. And again, we're nascent. This just started on March 25th or so. Um, but uh, just as when we accept poems um, out of the podcast, the poem's going to live on the podcast page until we really publish it inside our pages, right? Once we go inside our pages, we're just gonna have a hyperlink that leads you into issue 97 or wherever it is. You following me? So yeah. we could actually um, let concerned poets know that, that if they should end up getting accepted elsewhere, uh, we can link to that Elsewhere magazine. I don't know. We're making an, editor an editorial decision I, 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 on it. What do you think? I, what do you think, I, editors? I love that idea because I, I, I want to say I don't think it's the same as publication. I'm, and I would come down pretty hard on like in opposition to this notion of it being, quote, publication, because I read those show notes like an essay. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a review essay of the episode. So it's like citing and, and incorporating the work that's been discussed in the episode is like citing a poem in an essay, right? Yeah. And so I don't, you know, I don't know my copyright law well enough to know that if you cite a poem in whole in an essay, if you have to get permission from, from the authors, but that's kind of what we're doing with the legal notice. Right. So when, when the authors agree to participate in the podcast, right, they're giving us permission to discuss but and also to post, right? So right. I have total sympathy for people who would believe that this feels like publication. It would somehow detract from get them getting their pieces published elsewhere. But I I take you know the the posting of the poem in the show notes is almost being cited in an essay rather than being published anywhere. Yeah, the I mean <laughs> the intellectual I, property the lawyers. Last, like, the, 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 the the last the last couple of times I published essays about poems, I had to. Um, sign a piece of paper saying that I hadn't quoted more than 20% of the poem. Oh, right. right. And yeah. That was the, um, I think that was the University of Georgia Press, the university. It was, it was, a, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a um, university press. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to actually edit the, I, it, I had to count lines and, and there were a couple yeah. of poems that I had, because they were short poems. Yeah. Like, yeah. But guess, and guess. In order to like, satisfy the lawyers, I had to cut down Absolutely. Uh, when I was quoting, so it would be less than 20%. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what? That is different, though. I have had these conversations. The intellectual property lawyers that looked at our, you know, helped us make our contract for this, um, say, it, it, even though it is in its entirety, because we get permission, right? right it, we are allowed to do it. What you're talking about, Jason, you don't even need permission. I don't want to be like, talk about me time, but I've gotten quoted like crazy, especially when I used to write for Philadelphia Magazine all the time, big whole paragraphs, but ex without permission, without my knowledge. But you know how every now and then you Google yourself? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, every now and then I've Googled myself and found myself in places that I didn't know I was. And um, including, you know, a couple parenting books that were wow, it was that uh, stunning, stunning. Because you know how they put like um, pages on Amazon or whatever. Yeah. Like, who knows that that would even hyperlink that deep into yeah. uh, a page? You know what I'm saying? But my point is only that you're allowed to to take chunks without the author's permission. But 
uh, we are getting the author's permission. And We're because, because sure. it isn't in the pages proper, it's not being published. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's definitely sticky and tricky, and I, I also feel the sympathy for people. But I certainly uh, feel like this is a critique in a way, you know? I mean, it's not we are talking about people's pieces in a way that's supposed to be structured and helpful criticism. It's not, I really feel like it's you know almost the equivalent of having a kind of workshop activity mm-hmm. in a class. It's just a refined workshop. We're an editorial board and this is what we do. So, I mean, I certainly, if I do feel like this airs more on the side of not being published, but being <laughs> kind of presented, having a public presentation of a critique or something, you know, equivalent to that. So it's, it is annoying yeah, to yeah, have to deal with all this stuff. I, I want to come back to something Kathy said in the past, too, and that's the distinction, right, between publishing and posting. Right? Yeah, definitely. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a great description of what the podcast is, right? It's a sort of nuanced critique and nuanced workshop of, of a poet's submission. But the layer of, like, you know, getting permission, getting like having poets sign a, a legal form, giving us permission to discuss and post Mm -hmm. the um, poems really does raise a question about what counts as publication in the 21st century, like in our media environment, in this sort of wild ecology of Facebook and blogging and, you know, what counts as publication. I think we've, we found a little niche, a little pocket that hasn't been fully explored or articulated right we're in the middle of doing it well you know whenever we've talked with with our attorney he talks about the fact that it's the wild wild west and yeah. and so much has not been determined um paul siegel one of our editors um has seen magazines expressly say if you published this on facebook <clears throat> we we don't want to see it right and i i as an editor i don't know what you guys think about that but I wouldn't care. I would still publish it. I wouldn't consider Facebook mm. a publication. Um, but, I, you know, magazines are making their own choices mm-hmm. on what they consider, you know. Um, I but I think, I think we should uh, resolve that we will make that offer, that if we should reject your poem and you send it elsewhere, we'll take it the heck down, right? Yeah. And just yeah. hyper, hyperlink to the page where it will go, where it will be. We certainly want to be considerate of other people, you know, so. Yeah, and and that goes to the sort of like the networking possibilities of the the web, certainly, but also the network of of literary magazines, right? Like, it's like, that will show evidence of the field of literary magazines um, in a really funky and cool way if we are linking out to the other places that are snapping the poems up. Yeah. I think that's cool. I think that's cool, too. Yeah. Um, cause it just shows also like, Hey, no hurt feelings. You know what I mean? Yeah. The whole Kit Kats yeah. and Snickers thing. I like it a lot. So, yeah. okay. Well, that was a surprise. I didn't expect to get that, um, resolved. Uh, is there anything else that anybody would like to talk about, about these issues? Um, I guess just from a student's perspective, I, I'm just saying that I think it's interesting that we're having this conversation because in academia, there's already, I mean, there's plenty of debates about, like, what you can use, you know, in a class to teach and, like, you know, quoting from other people's material or excerpting it or something. But this is a discussion that's already been um, kind of, like, hashed out, you know, in different ways. And this, I sort of consider this to be an academic, you know, because we're critiquing it, because we're coming at it from a helpful point of view. But, yeah, because it's not exactly in a university classroom or sort of in a different setting for this. Uh, it's a conversation that isn't completely new, but people somehow don't think of it in these terms. Uh, so it's certainly, you know, to be determined. But that's kind of how I personally feel, you know, we, we're looking at it for our particular publication and podcast. So, yeah, and you you've know. grown up on screens, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> For the most part. But, you know, Isabella, I would sort of link your comment back to Jason's, too, and that question of, like, proprietary, um, like, like knowledge, right? So that, you know, the example Jason gave was that Morrison was on contract, right? Mm-hmm. So, they, so the, the publication had right of first refusal. I keep thinking of somebody like, you know, Joan Allaire or even, you know, um, Fred Zakaria, who ran afoul of this, right, by well, Joan Allaire, for instance, like blogging about topics and then selling, right, the, the topics he blogged about to Wired or to The New Yorker. So he's basically uh, yeah. double dipping on content. Yeah. And right. then the publications were furious because they're trying to develop a subscriber base. Mm-hmm. And that was part of what I think what Jason was talking about, like subscribers are looking for 
the pieces and they want, you know, the publication would want the reader to come to them, not be sort of filtered out into this, you know, web of other possibilities or right. to be able to read this, the same content in two places. Yes, yes. The, the privilege of the, the publisher. So, right. But I don't think that's what we're doing here. I, I think we've, we've figured something else out in a way. Right. Um, and it does, it does feel like that sort of, you know, scholarly conversation and editorial conversation plus the value added of the pieces themselves. Yeah. It also dovetails with something that sort of has, has been kind of something I've been thinking about a long time, which is this idea of whether editors are gatekeepers yeah. or curators. Mm. And that we're often kind of figured as gatekeepers who are, you know, kind of keeping certain people out that we're, you know, I, I, as the editor of BLR, I was actually accused of keeping women out of the pages. Wow which is insane because I went back and I counted and 70% of the authors that <laughs> published were female. Oh my oh, lord. Oh wow. Oh dear. But I got this letter telling me that I was this terrible gatekeeper and <laughs> my aesthetics couldn't include women. Because you rejected uh, her? What? You rejected someone, I'm thinking? I, 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 I <laughs> presume that I, it, it, was, it was a very angry letter. Um, okay, all right, we'll skip that but, part. But the, the mm -hmm. point was that, you know, like here is this person telling me that I'm this terrible gatekeeper and my feeling is like, no, I'm a curator. Like what I'm doing, right, right. I didn't, I, when you, if I rejected your poem, I didn't say, and now the, you know, I'm not like the, the villain in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, like dip your yeah, poem. That's, that's <laughs> perfect, Jason, oh my gosh. And, and now your poem can't do anything in the world. It's just that, you know, I'm curating for a very particular audience. And I really value the magazines that do a lot of curation for me. Like, and I really value the Atlantic and I really value the New Yorker and I really value. Exactly. Right. I, I totally agree with you. Job of that. And I'm, I'm hoping that this podcast is kind of like making clearer the ways in which we're curating and the ways, like what kind of goes into putting together the things that we think our readership wants to read. Right. Um, as opposed to kind of thinking about it as, you know, we have standards and we must keep out the things that do not meet them, which I, th which I think is how we're often perceived. Like right, right. We're sort of starting or... Right. It's funny that you say that, Jason, because, I mean, I think you're completely right. And I think the other perception that people might sometimes have is that editors are, like, nitpicky. Uh, you know, the job is to go through and proofread. And that's sort of the sole obligation. So you sort of, you have these kind of polarities going on. And I think the word curator is such an accurate word. That's certainly more what I feel when I talk about editing or talk about editors. And it's such a an appropriate way of phrasing it. So you've got it. I think you really nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I know people who even th who think that editors are looking for what's wrong. Yeah, right? Exactly. You're just looking for what's wrong instead of looking for what we can pop champagne corks about. Indeed. I can yeah. attest that we look for lots of things that are right. <laughs> so don't feel this way, people. Yeah. We're good. Um, we would so love to know what you, our listeners, are thinking um, about all of these issues. Uh, so please um, let us know on our Facebook page. We create an event for every episode. So you could look for episode 10 um, for this one. Um, just thank you for listening. Thank you for sending us work. Um, send, sign up for our email list and, and um, also send us a self-addressed self -addressed stamped envelope if you still can recall what those are. <laughs> we used to call them sazies. Do you know that term? Yes, I do. Wow, she knows that term and she's only 22 or yeah. so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but do it. Well, We're going to give you a sticker. For the price of a sazy, we'll send you a fabulous PBQ podcast slash pile um, sticker. Yes. Um, so thank you. Read on iTunes. Oh, and you can um, subscribe wherever um, you get your podcast. You can get us on pbq.trexel.edu, and you can uh, get us on iTunes. And please review us there. It actually really affects how much it floats up to the top of people suggested uh, podcasts. So uh, write us up. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. This podcast is produced through a joint venture of Drexel University's Office of Information, Resources, and Technology and the Painted Bride Quarterly Magazine. This podcast is the property of Painted Bride Quarterly Magazine. All rights reserved.